hit old lines of gin. And I became aware, not me, but my staff, researchers, about ancestors that I knew nothing about. Since that time, they've developed uh, more and more <coughs> present to me through various avenues. And now, what I said, in a way, the last Sunday of June, that my, that my ancestors came to America so I could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some of those distant cousins of those early ancestors have showed up. Sherry, Anthony, thank God, that's one name I've been told. I think there's a couple more that I'm not going to speak because I don't know. But last week on Saturday, we talked about Roger Williams. And I'd heard a lot about Roger Williams. But out of all of this, I can see that Roger Williams was a man of God that had a revelation of the order of the church. And it's amazing. He had a revelation of what had to come before the church would ever be put in order. He had a revelation of what had to come before God would build up Zion. That's Psalm 102. And that is a set time. It says that God will build up Zion. Roger Williams, who was not related to me at all, had that revelation, that perception of the, God, of the church of Jesus Christ. What a blessing to, to talk with someone that is a, well, a descendant of Roger Williams. Today, we're going to talk about you are, and I'll talk some, read about, what's his name? John Coggershaw. Coggershaw? Yes. And Chad sure. Brown. Right. Right? Correct. All right, I'm going to let you read. If I be allowed to make a comment, you know I will. All right. All right. Paul Peters. Bless you. John Coggershaw was born about 1601 in Essex, England, to John and Anne Coggershaw. His father was referred to as John Coggershaw, so they were both John Coggershaw, junior and senior. Amen. And her will and his mom's will dated April 16, 1645. She said, Now dwelling in New England, my house and lands now at Sible Hittingham, together with the legacy given him by his uncle, John Butter. She also named his children in her will, John, Anne, Mary, Joshua, and James, leaving them an inheritance. At the time of the date of her will, she was living at Castle Heatingham, a village northeast of Essex. John was a successful merchant in the silk trade in England. John and his wife Mary, with their children, sailed for New England on June 23, 1632, on the ship, the Lion. That's amazing. The Lion, huh? Right. That's what Great Britain's called. Right. You know, I have great respect for these people that left their country coming to the United States, which were not the United States. Thank God to find a place where they could worship God. These people are uh, put down by ignorant people that know nothing about. I have read and heard it said they were all deists. That could not be true. No one 
no death would hazard his life or her life to get on one of those small ships, boats. When I saw the replica of the Mayflower, having been in the U.S. Navy four years, and went across the Pacific on a small carrier transport escort, Cape Esperance, 88, my goodness, small. And then I see replica of the Mayflower. I thought these were the most courageous people that could ever live believing in God, Jehovah, and Jesus, and would get on that little boat. I call it a little boat. <laughs> and come to a nation they'd heard about. Incredible to me. And don't think I think I'm a big time maritime person, a, a big sailor. You're wrong. I was at sea 15 days. I was a land person, a hospital corpsman. I went through boot camp in San Diego, California Naval Training Center. I started at the very bottom. Thank God. And I had great jobs every place in the Navy. I mean, I worked right up to work for the cap for Captain Medical Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, Marshall Cone, R.B. Shepherds and Burst, then Marshall Cone, and their boss was Vice Admiral Callahan. That's where I worked. What a blessing, but nothing compared to what I see from our, my ancestors that got on those boats and came over here because they trusted God. Paul? Amen. They came over here on the ship, the Lion, arriving in Boston about three months later on Sunday, September 16th. Three more children would be born in New England. They originally settled in Roxbury, where he became a free man and was elected as a member of the church at Roxbury. Roxbury was one of the several towns settled by the Winthrop fleet. Upon their arrival, upon their arrival, 11 ships of about 1,000 Puritans, led by John Winthrop, came to New England during the summer of 1630. This group of Puritans formed the nucleus of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, of which John Winthrop became governor. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, probably by simply sheer numbers, absorbed the previous colonies, such as Salem and Plymouth, under their jurisdiction. They incorporated their strict religious beliefs into their system of government. May I, may I say something? Sure. I'm reminded of Deborah, a prophetess, and she said to some person that he should go. He was a leader. He should go and do something. It's been years since I read this. And she said, well, I'll go with you. Well, he said, if you'll go with me. She said, I'll go with you, but you will get no honor out of this. Did you know that, that group of people came 10 years after the Mayflower and after uh, others, and they ended up not getting much honor. Right. Amen. Go ahead. They incorporate the Massachusetts Bay Colony incorporated their strict religious beliefs into their system of government and ruled with the same oppressive authority that so many had sought to escape in England. Many separatists who had came for religious liberty fled or were driven from the Massachusetts Colony's jurisdiction. The Coggeshalls later moved to Boston and became neighbors with William and Anne Hutchinson. John also became a supporter of Anne Hutchinson, who did not adhere 
to the religious doctrine of the Puritans and believed in a covenant of grace, not of works. The Hutchinsons were expelled from Massachusetts, as was John, not long after. That's interesting. She believed in grace, not works. Right. But was a Puritan, right? It doesn't say that. Oh, okay. She, it just says she did not adhere to the religious doctrine of the Puritans. Oh, thank but, you. But believed in a covenant of grace. Thank you for correcting me. That's great. Thank God. Amen. That's a, listen, grace is, without grace, there's nothing. Without faith, it's impossible, please God. But grace and faith, faith man. <laughs> grace and faith work together. If there's no faith, grace won't do much. I've really hit a, not a bump in the road. I had a mountain, amen, that landed right on my head. Thank God. I'm grateful to hear what this woman stood for. Man. Let's go. They were expelled not long after that, and like others, they were moved to what became Rhode Island. William Coddington, John Clark, William, and Ann Hutchinson, along with John Coggeshaw and others, purchased Aquidneck Island from the Indians, facilitated by Roger Williams. They initially settled a Pocasset, which later became Portsmouth. They set up their government according to the law of Moses. And it seems William Coddington had the greatest influence over the group. He was named as judge, and John Coggershaw was one of the named elders. Although little is written of John Coggershaw, William Coddington's name appears in a number of histories. Samuel Gordon had also been exiled from Massachusetts County with great threatenings, including death. He came to Portsmouth, and there he again met with the government similar to the one he had just left. There was much dissension, and the administration of Coddington was ousted, and a civil government based on English law who was formed with the influence of Samuel Garden, who, was, who although self-taught, was well-versed in English law. Samuel Gordon and many others did not believe government had the right to dictate man's conscience. William Hutchinson was appointed chief magistrate with Gordon as assistant. It was a government similar to our republic today. John Congress, along with the other appointed elders, followed the ousted William Connington to another area and formed a new colony, which they called Newport. John Coggeshaw was involved with the government there at Newport. There were years of strife and trouble between the colonies of Rhode Island and also Massachusetts Bay Colony, which is discussed at great length in Adelos Gordon's book, The Life of Times of Samuel Gordon. Adelos Gordon is one of Samuel Gordon's descendants. Amen. Right. In 1647, John Coggeshaw served briefly as the president or chief magistrate of the colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantation, which, in, which included the four colonies of Newport, Portsmouth, Providence, and Warwick. He died while serving mm -hmm. in that capacity on November 27, 1647. So he died pretty young, in his mid-40s. John's son Joshua was born in England and came with his parents to New England. He also served in public office for many years. Joshua married Joan West, and their daughter, Humility, married Benjamin Green. It is through hum Humility and Benjamin that Dole Davidson traces his ancestry to John Coggershaw. Well, praise God. And that Sherry Anthony you mentioned, uh, she has a main, just almost a straight main line right up to Coggershaw, from Coggershaw down to her second great grandmother. Amen. We'll go on to Chad Brown. Right. Amen. Chad Brown came to New England with his wife, Elizabeth, and their young son, John, about 1638 in the ship Martin. They landed in Boston. But historians write that not long after, he was exiled from Massachusetts for conscience sake and moved to Providence Plantation 
joining with Roger Williams in the 12 original settlers of Providence. He was one of the signers of the Providence Compact, the first civil compact of the colony, which addressed disputes among the early settlers of the colony and those who came later. He was considered an arbitrator of the early colony, and Roger Williams mentioned him in a letter. The truth is, Chad Brown, that wise and godly soul, now with God, with myself, brought the remaining aftercomers in the first twelve to a oneness by arbitration. Brown was also appointed to a committee as a surveyor to list the town lots and the meadows allotted to them and also served on the committee to resolve boundary disputes between Pawtuxet and Providence. Later, while Roger Williams was in England obtaining an official charter of, for the colony, he served on a committee determining the governance of the colony. When Roger Williams separated himself from the Providence Church, Chad Brown became the minister and remained as such until his death, which has been stated as about 1665. He was buried on his own lot in Providence, but his and his wife's remains were removed to the North Burial Ground in 1792. It is believed Chad and Elizabeth had seven children, and Brown University is named after his descendant, Nicholas Brown Jr., and is situated on part of the lot where Chad Brown lived. Doyle Davidson and David Casbright traced their lineage to Chad Brown through his son, John, who married Mary Holmes. Thank God.